Welcome back to Celebrity Radio. It's Alex Belfield here in Sin City. Made our way to Hooters Hotel and Casino, which is right here in the heart of Las Vegas, opposite the MGM Grand and next to the Tropicana, and home to Kevin Lapine. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Now, Lapine or Lapine, which do you prefer? Lapine. Well, I think yep. Lapine. You see, it makes you sound incontinental, a bit more sort of high end. And and it it honestly depends where you're from. Um, I've also noticed that like if people who are deeply, deeply Catholic, if they're not thinking it'll come out lupine because they've studied <laughs> Latin so much that they'll just go to, to that. But yeah, it was actually uh, Mary de Lapine, a uh, French Canadian name. Listen, congratulations. I've just sat here watching your show and this is the final show of 56 that I've seen in the last two and a half wow. weeks. It's been quite a few, uh, it's been quite a few days of my life spent with showgirls uh, here yes. in Las Vegas. And what's interesting about your show, I was kind of nervous coming to see you because I'm done with these shows really because they don't go far enough and it all seems a bit silly. You take it a bit further than most and it does have an edge. I, I, I don't wish to be crude, but if these shows are nice, they somehow don't work. You know, it's it depends what you mean by nice. Here's my big rule. Um, I'm You're going to do really adult stuff in my show. But my rule is, if it's my girlfriend, my wife, my mom, my sister, or God forbid, if it was me in that chair, would I feel good about what I did? My number one thing is I want you to feel good about it. Because if you feel good, everybody else is going to feel good. So, yeah, I'm going to make you have an orgasm. I'm going to make you watch really weird movies. I'm going to make you reach out and interact with things that you did not plan on interacting with. You know, I'm going to switch around some body parts here and there. It's but cheeky and a bit rude. You're putting people out of their comfort zone. That's the whole point of it. Um, however, it is not X-rated. There is no nudity. This is not improper. There's nothing that you would be embarrassed in front of your mother of doing. Um, but it's great entertainment. And you got a huge ovation tonight. I mean, is this an average show tonight? Did I see a good one, an average one, or a bad one? Um, I would say they were a really good crowd. It was kind of an average show. It, it was a smaller show. But when you do 300 shows a year, some of them are going to be smaller. Some of them are going to be bigger. And it's just about, somebody once told me, you don't go to war with the army you want, you go to war with the army you have. And if I have a smaller night, this is this was still a crowd of 30 people who didn't want to see Celine Dion. They didn't want to see Blue Man Group. They came here because they wanted to have fun. I'm going to make sure that happens. And you're right, you do have to go to an edge because there is something about the whole nature of hypnosis that a person goes, eh, I would just do that anyway. You almost have to go to a point where you go, oh, there's no way that person would do, oh my God, they're doing that. And when you can get that moment, and if you can combine it with a moment where people in the audience also go, I wish I'd have gone up there. I wish I would have volunteered. Oh, I never thought that, by the yeah. way. That would be my idea of a nightmare being pulled up on your stage. I think what you've mastered is the line between awkward and creepy. You don't cross it, and that's what's good about this show. You make people be a bit awkward, but it doesn't sort of cross a line. And I suppose that's about your moral compass and your own boundaries. You started off legitimately doing hypnosis to help people stop smoking and lose weight and all those other things that's, that's great about hypnosis. And then you decided to become the entertainer and do it as a stage show. What was the morning you woke up and thought, hang on, there's a career in this. Actually, I did it that route, but it was with the opposite intention. I always knew that I was going to use my powers for evil instead of good. But I also knew that if I'm going to be messing with people's brains, if I'm going to be working with strangers every night, night in, night out, I'd better know everything about the science that I can just to make sure that nobody ever ends up in a bad position. Safety is my number one rule. Um, and I, I really appreciate what you said because it's true. I'll put you in an awkward position. But I'm never going to put you in a creepy position. Because the moment you take somebody down a creepy road, everybody in the audience starts going, ugh. And you feel uncomfortable for that, for that moment. One of the greatest bits of advice that I ever got. And now remember, I started doing hypnosis shows when I was like 19, 20. So, I mean, you know, I kind of started it when we're all in that punk rock phase of I'll do anything. And a, a very good mentor put his hand on my shoulder and went, remember, not all laughter is good laughter. Sometimes people laugh because they're uncomfortable. And you may have gotten the laugh, but if they're uncomfortable, are they ever gonna come back? Yeah. 
It's a very good point. And of course, these are human beings who all have families. And you know what they say, what happens in Las Vegas ends up on Facebook. People are exactly. taking pictures and stuff like that. Um, I noticed you had a wide age group as well tonight. That's fascinating that people from all ages are mesmerized by this, as am I. It's a medium that I don't fully understand. I don't know the science behind it, but I've seen enough of these shows to know that it's real, to know that you don't have a budget to pay people to sit there. These are not actors. And therefore you're solely reliant on the public. That makes me nervous because the public can sometimes let you down oh there's always that moment when you're doing the when i'm doing the induction and it's that moment that i know that every trapeze artist feels too it's that moment you let go of that trapeze and you know that next one better be there or it's a long way down uh, but you learn you know i didn't start off here in vegas uh you, you, most hypnotists start off doing high schools and hypnotizing high school students isn't so much like shooting fish in a barrel as much as it is, is it's like looking at fish in an aquarium it is the easiest thing you're going to do especially because most of those shows are at 4 in the morning for like the after prom stuff and yeah when I walk out at 4 in the morning and go you're sleepy they'll go wow he's good <laughs> you know uh, but you learn there and then you start going into some of the, the corporate markets where you're working with people who are a little bit more uncomfortable with wanting to do it. And you learn how to make all these different groups feel comfortable. If I can get you excited about the idea of volunteering, then going under is easy. But if you're walking up there thinking, oh my God, he's gonna tear me in half. And a perfect example, now, unfortunately your listeners don't get to see this, but I'm gonna kind of spell this out. So tonight we had a group of four show up late. Um, the, a group of four showed up after I had explained about hypnosis, after I explained what was going to happen, but before I called for volunteers. And they got here just as I called for volunteers. They sent up two from their group. You'll notice that the one I sent down even before I started doing the induction and the other one didn't go under. They weren't comfortable. They didn't know what to expect. They didn't know what was going to happen. They didn't feel any necessarily any trust with me. So they were apprehensive. That apprehension is going to stop you from going under. It was interesting. I once interviewed Paul McKenna, who is our oh, biggest yes. and most legendary oh, yes. hypnotist. And he absolutely 100% believes that you will never do anything on that stage that you wouldn't do sober or in this planet, if you like. Do you believe that or can you convince people to go beyond what they would normally do? Okay. It's my favorite lie in hypnosis. And the lie is... You won't do anything under hypnosis that you wouldn't, you know, that, that would go against your personality. Uh, now, where exactly are you from? Nottingham, Nottingham in England. Okay. Now, I know that the gun laws are different there than they are here, but we're gonna play pretend for a minute. And the pretend is, um, you, I just handed you a gun. Would you go out in the casino and shoot some people? No, I'd, I'd prefer not to. Well, I mean, come on, think about it. There'll be a loud explosion. Sirens will go off. There'll be, like, colorful stuff all over the wall. I get attention. Now. Yeah, exactly. Be, yeah. Okay, but, I'm needy, and yeah. I need attention. But but you're, you're not interested in that level of no, attention. No, that's not for me. Not okay. tonight. I've got a plane to catch right. tomorrow to Michigan, and i got things to do. But let, let's change this around. Do you have any nieces or nephews? Yeah. Okay. Uh, a niece? Uh, a nephew. A nephew. Okay. You're in a house with your nephew. Your leg is broken. The guy who broke your leg is coming at you and your nephew with a knife. You have a gun. Would you shoot them? It's a very good question to which I don't know the answer. I'd like to think that I would protect him. I don't know whether I'd be brave enough to shoot the gun. That's, that's the issue. It, it, but all it, the point I'm making is... It's all about the circumstance. Exactly. Would, in any given situation, what would or wouldn't a person do? Now, there is no way that I can put somebody into that dramatic of a situation, your conscious mind never shuts off. You would pop up and immediately you realize this isn't happening. But I can take you into situations where it feels right at that moment to do something silly. As long as I don't do something that really crosses a boundary that is a non-dire Emergency. It's interesting, Kevin. I mean, I've interviewed a lot of you guys over the years, most of the guys here in Las Vegas, and you're the first one to admit that. They all play by the lie, as you're telling mm -hmm. me, that actually you would never do that. And what you say makes absolute sense, because by the same token, the 50, 60, 70-year-old, whatever she was, lady this evening who was kissing her husband on stage, certainly would never have done that if mm -hmm. she'd have been here with us, you and I just sat here now. So 
right, what's the difference between that scenario and the other scenario that you've just put forward? Exactly. And if I and, and like in the case where I will have a married couple kiss and maybe they're not a couple that is really uh, good at public displays of affection. But if I can create a moment where it's the right thing to do and you feel good for doing it, you feel great with it. You really do. There's a euphoria about your show and you sort of crescendo. I always find these shows for me in the beginning a bit boring because I know I ain't going up. There's no way you're getting me on that stage and I ain't being part of it. It takes a good 30 minutes for you to actually work your craft because let's remember, you can't start the show at 7.30 and by 7.31 do the shtick that you're doing 30, 40 minutes later. It takes time. And in that process, what's interesting watching you is I can never work out what you do, even though I'm watching you do it. It's fascinating. Well, I've also been surrounded by great people. I used to hate hypnosis shows because every hypnosis show boiled down to, I'm a jerk who wants to make you look like an idiot. And when I got surrounded by friends and we came up with this idea that said, I've got something fun and interesting to share with you. And if you volunteer, I'll make you the star of tonight's show. The show became fun. So I don't do, you know, a a lot of hypnotists will use the word pre-talk in the beginning of their show because they're conditioning their audience uh, to become proper committee members. I hate all of those terms. I will never do a pre-talk. I've worked with too many amazing comedians. Um, The amazing Jonathan, for example, has helped me rewrite my opening monologue over and over. And I don't even consider it that much of a monologue because there are moments in it that it becomes a dialogue. You know, it's it's a living, breathing thing. So the first 15, 20 minutes of my show is more elements of stand-up comedy, but it's interactive comedy. Then it's getting the people up there, and also now once they're seated in their chairs, don't get don't 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 mistake it for a second. They're terrified. Jerry Seinfeld once said, "The most common fear in the world is public speaking. Number two is death." If you're at a funeral, you would rather be in the coffin than giving the eulogy. So the next couple of minutes, once they're up on stage, it's some more jokes. But those jokes are designed to make you feel comfortable up there and to make you go, I don't want to be the star of the show. I've come to see your show. Now, thank God the entire audience isn't like me because there is an audience full of people who run up on that stage to be your stars. And thank God, because you wouldn't have an act without them. Now, once they're up there, you then have to condition them, as you phrase it, to, to do what you need them to do later on. And again, what was refreshing about you is your ability to ad lib. I can't imagine, it's kind of obvious in a way because it's a different audience every night, but to shows would be very different if I came tomorrow night I guess I would see a completely different show oh god yeah because there'd be different personalities I I might even change some routines the biggest job of a good hypnotist and now you've said that you've seen too many of these shows and believe me I understand what you mean by that because there are so many hypnotists it's a boring it's a flat show there's no crescendo there's no rise there's no fall it's kind of like they're sitting there just muttering something they heard somebody else do a good hypnotist. The number one skill you need is you have to be able to read the people up there on stage. I have to be able to size you up, figure out where your personality is, and go, okay, his personality's here. If I use you for this, you are going to look like a superstar. If I use her for that, she's gonna freak out. She's gonna be uncomfortable and her friends, cause you can tell who's with who in the audience too, and her friends will freak out. Well, you say you can tell, you can tell yes. because this is your skill. And I, I guess reading people is a bigger skill than any of the stuff, the mentalism uh, and putting them into mm-hmm. hypnosis. Because if you get that wrong, again, you're backing yourself into cul-de-sacs you can't get out of. Oh yeah, and the last thing you want to hear is an, is an entire audience go, ooh, because you uh, told somebody to do something that is really inappropriate. But it's, it's, it's finding that fun zone, putting them there, and then just growing with it. You know, people will give you moments, uh, like, like the girl tonight who ended up stuffing all of those napkins in her pants, and it looked like she was a really well-endowed guy. There's no way I can't not play with that moment. You know. What was also lovely tonight, when you were ready to go and you'd done your show, they weren't ready to go yet. Mm. I mean, they begged you to do more. I suppose there's no greater affirmation for any performer in Las Vegas to be screamed at encore. That moment, it's, it's why you do it. You don't become a performer for the money. If you, get, if you got in this career for the money, 
you'd have made more doing just about anything <laughs> else. Well, if you think about it. The bar guy's making oh, more money. Oh, <laughs> God, yes. Oh, yeah. Well, especially when you're starting off. You don't start off doing good shows. No, you start off in crap clubs in the middle of nowhere for 50 bucks, and you drove three hours each way to get that 50 bucks. You know, I mean, the due paying part of it is what takes forever, but I've also watched people skip the dues paying part and it comes back to collect. We were talking about this last night. I went to see Terry Fater, who has signed a 10-year contract mm-hmm. after appearing on AGT, and he was a star overnight. What people forget, he'd done 30 years of the most miserable career you could possibly imagine. As he said, he'd, some days he'd do 2, 4, 7, and 10 shows, then drive four hours to the next place to do 2, 4, 7, and 10. They couldn't hear him. The PA system was bad. And therefore, I reached my next question, which is when you finally arrive in a theatre which is controlled environment where you know the sound's going to work, your guy's taking care of you, you've got your assistant on stage i guess this is the dream is it it lets you do something you were never able to do before it lets you breathe the great thing i've got a sound guy who i trust he knows how to read my mind now he knows my cues i have an assistant behind me who knows the show who knows what i'm looking for i don't have to talk to people whose eyes are closed i now get to interact with the audience i get to talk with my audience more And they get to direct me to where they want to go, which is so much better than having to go, oh my God, what's this person doing? What's that doing? What's my next sound cue? It's nice to be able to go, that's all handled behind me. I can deal with everything in front of me. And I guess the greatest compliment of all is that your face is on the poster and your name is on the poster and they've made a choice. I always say to any performer, the fact you have one person in your showroom is a miracle because there isn't a square mile anywhere else in this country or in the world where you're competing with so many entertainers for attention. One of my friends summed it up really well. He said, it is a bloody fist fight for every audience member I get. And, And it's true. And... Now, I'm not going to knock Cirque for this. I'm not going to knock Copperfield. I'm not going to knock uh, what Terry Fader has. I'm not going to knock any of that stuff. They have a bigger budget. They have a bigger production. But I have to fill enough seats to cover me, a sound guy, and an assistant. I don't have to cover 300 techs in a show for Cirque. So, I mean, you know, it's, you'll hear a lot of performers go, oh, well, sir, blah, 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 blah. You know, they just buy the 300 people they have coming in there. Yeah, I would probably kill myself over their production budget. It's, it's, but that's half the work too is, somebody once told me it's called show business and business is the bigger word. Mm -hmm. And you can have the best show in the world, but if you don't know how to market it, if you don't know how to reach it out to people, if you don't know how to put it in front of the people who are going to appreciate it, you're doomed. So I say to my show every night, tickets to my show cost anywhere from 1,800 to 2,600 bucks because you can't- You're the only one I've heard use that line, by the way. It's very, very true. It, It is. You flew to Vegas. You're staying in the hotel. You're eating in the restaurants. It costs you a lot of money before you've walked in the door for my show. And here's the difference between Vegas and just about anywhere else. Everybody in my audience is sitting there going, I could have gone to Blue Man Group tonight. What do you have for me that makes me feel good that I came here? And thankfully I had a lot of mentors over my shoulder when I got here to Vegas because it's a different animal. But that moment where you hear not a giggle, but you hear that real laughter and that real clapping. What it sounds like to me isn't just laughing and clapping. It sounds like a group of people who go, I am so glad I came here tonight instead of anywhere else. And that's huge. It's beautiful. Kevin, it was so nice to meet you and great to see your show as well. Your spirit on stage and your enthusiasm to do this show, um, I think is probably greater than anyone else I've seen in this town. You seem to love it and enjoy it. And I think the second you're taking it for granted, you should go elsewhere. I won't name names. Last night I walked out of a show. In fact, I stomped out of a show. I was so livid at how awful it was. And it was one of the biggest here in Las Vegas. Contempt for an audience, I think, is the worst sin for any entertainer. Oh, God, yes. Uh, Nobody in that... So everybody in the audience, they paid 100% of what you asked them to pay. Um, and even, even if we remove the analogy about coming here to Vegas, if a show ticket 
is 50 bucks. Nowadays with the economy, people are lucky to be making about 15 bucks an hour. After taxes, that means you had to work about four hours to get a ticket to my show, but you probably brought a date. So you had to put an entire day in just to be able to afford the tickets. I, you don't owe me anything more than the ticket you paid for to walk in. I owe you 100% of my show to make it that value for what you spent. And the second that you cannot appreciate your audience, you'll, you can't last. You turn around and, especially nowadays, TripAdvisor, Yelp, um, all of the review sites out there, the word gets around fast. Your work ethic is amazing. Your show is great. It's here at Hooters. You can come and see you uh, every night at eight o'clock and you knock it out of the park and the audience just loved you. You have a great warmth and that's probably the greatest compliment I can pay you. Kevin, thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming out again.